Hello, and welcome back to the Product Launch Podcast. As always, I'm the host, Sean Boyce, CEO and founder of Next Step. I'd like to welcome my guest to the show today, Trip Odell. Uh, Trip's experience in product portfolio is diverse. It includes consumer hardware, software, cloud services, enterprise software, among others, it's solving complex problems at scale. Trip's grounded product expertise combines a track record of envisioning, defining, and shipping new ideas, products, and technology, resulting in new products, services, intellectual property, and driving business outcomes at companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Adobe. Trip is the new CXO at the Y Combinator company Habitat, based right here in Philadelphia, which deals with last mile delivery technology. Hello, Trip. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. Hey, Sean. How are you? Uh, thanks for having me on. Excellent. Um, thank you for being here. We're very much looking forward to diving into the content today. I know you have a very diverse background, so naturally I have lots of questions. <laughs> LinkedIn doesn't have a, have a job status called it's complicated. You know, it's, it's our job history. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. We need a, that's an interesting feature that could potentially looking at adding though. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for being here, Trip. And before we kind of dive into the topic that we want to geek out about today, if you could, can you give a little bit more information about your background for our listeners so they can learn more? Well, wow, that's a uh, that's a lot to fit into just uh, just the intro, uh, but I'll <laughs> I'll do my best, Sean. Um, so uh, I often tell people that like, I'm the Forrest Gump of design. I've sort of bounced all over the place. I grew up on the East Coast. Uh, I have lived all over the country, um, uh, and uh, I actually got my start as a high school teacher. I was in the, a teacher in the Jesuit Volunteers on an Indian reservation in South Dakota where um, I was teaching photography and staying a couple weeks ahead of the kids and things like Photoshop and Illustrator and flat, early Flash. And that was about 20 years ago. I taught high school for a few more years, went to graduate school, and eventually found my way into big tech, where I worked at Adobe on consumer products and their first consumer cloud products with Photoshop, um, Microsoft on their consumer cloud services and SkyDrive and the integrations with Windows 8. And then at Amazon and Audible, I worked on all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, everything from vehicular interfaces and uh, experiences to early parts of Alexa and the first year of its release, uh, last mile technology. I even was able to get a couple of patents and new product ideas out the door uh, that came out of my team. So it was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Very cool. And thank you for sharing. Sounds like some very interesting stops along the way and some incredible uh, experience as well, too, in terms of the projects that you got to work on at obviously some very significant uh, organizations. So um, where we kind of wanted to go next is talking about the topic we wanted to dive into more today, which is going to surround mostly around your current role as a CXO at Habitat and talking about how, you know, what Habitat is, um, how it does it, how it uniquely differentiates itself in a crowded but very active space, especially currently. So I'd love to hear more from you there and how it relates to your new role as CXO. So probably first place to start would be to learn more about what Habitat is, and then we can talk more about your role. Sure. So um, Habitat is a last mile delivery uh, technology company, and we work with restaurants uh, primarily to uh, help them deliver their food uh, quickly uh, and cost effectively uh, compared to many of the competitors in that space right now, uh, Uber Eats and that sort of thing, where they take a significant portion of the restaurant owner's um, gross sales. So they'll take like 30% of an order in order to uh, get it to their customer. Um, we just take a flat fixed fee. We can actually make it we can make it profitable for a restaurant owner to offer delivery, um, whether they add a charge or not. Uh, and that's a function of the technology that we develop and sort of the approach where we, we see ourselves allied with small business owners in a way that other companies perhaps are not. Uh, and that's really important to us. But I think like when you look at us simply through the lens of, um, well, it's like Uber Eats, um, it's like saying that Amazon was, is an online bookstore. Uh, it's early days. Uh, and a lot of the reason that I came to Habitat is that uh, Andrew, the founder and, and the co-founding team, um, remind me they have that s similar sort of uh, attitude and, and uh, worldview that I saw every day at Amazon. 
uh, and it's looking at opportunities and opportunities and how they stack up. And we call those flywheels at Amazon. It's like, well, if you can do this one thing over here and make our, our web services a little bit more efficient, well, we could go and resell that and that's now AWS, right? So that, that's the way, that's sort of a very Amazonian way of thinking and, a very, and, and that's where Andrew and I initially connected uh, and uh, they brought me on to be the chief experience officer. Awesome story. Thank you for sharing, uh, especially when it comes to the business model and how it relates to your customers, which I'm sure they appreciate because I've heard plenty of complaints from those local businesses looking to leverage these new technology companies, but those companies ultimately kind of cannibalizing their business model. So making it really hard for them to continue to compete using and leveraging these technologies, which seem to be becoming more of a mandatory option if these businesses want to move forward. So I want to dive more into that, but before we get there, I want to talk more about your role, right? CXO. And if you could define that for us in terms of what it is, what it means, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it from there. Yeah. Uh, so I had to, this was, uh, this was my first sales job uh, to Andrew was telling him why I wanted to be CXO instead of COO. Uh, and I think uh, COO is a, uh, is a familiar title to a lot of people, but it's, it's actually, uh, it's just as ambiguous as a CXO, like from company to company, what a chief operating officer does can be very different. Um, CXO is a relatively new C-suite role, primarily on companies that are based on the West Coast. Uh, and typically the mandate, especially in a software company for this is to run human-centered design and research the product design aspects of what the company does and all of this in, entailed there, as well as the, um, the, the marketing function and sort of visual design and branding and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm of the point of view that that's actually far too limited a scope for uh, the responsibility of what a uh, chief experience officer should be. I come from a more of a cognitive science background and psychology background, and it's really about people, product, and process. So, um, and the people part of that uh, goes not just to uh, your customers, um, but in our case, our drivers uh, and our employees. And it goes to culture, how we operate, and if I learned anything at Amazon, the only thing that makes Amazon special as a big company, well, there's actually two things. One is the working backwards process, which is envisioning a very realistic view of what your product experience is going to be or your service offering is going to be from the day it releases and being very grounded and disciplined about working backwards from that vision. The other part are the leadership principles. And the leadership principles are something that's more than just a mission statement, is more than just something that goes up on the wall. It is something that you live and breathe and eat from day one. Uh, and day one is even its own thing. It's always day one at Amazon. So you're always constantly improving. And it's that behavioral expectation that um, can be the make or break for any early stage companies. Companies fail because they run out of money or they fail to achieve product market fit. But oftentimes they run out of time because the culture is not, it, it, it hasn't hired correctly or you have people that are communicating past one another or they're assume, assuming that they agree when there's actually uh, no productive disagreement and they keep going too far down the wrong way. So my responsibilities as I see them is to help with the culture and help the company find its own its own voice and its own point of view in how it works in the world. I have my own biases um, as well as how do we develop an experimental mindset to get to product market fit. We've got partial product market fit, but we think that the opportunity is far, far bigger. Uh, uh, and then I think um, process, which is how do you take what you've learned and take what you've improved in the product and operationalize that until you can automate it. Super fascinating. The perspective is amazing. And obviously now I have a million more questions, but that I love the fact that you had mentioned, right? You mentioned people process and product, but the people part is where you put extra emphasis on. And that culture, because I know you probably like myself as well too, have seen it work and it not work. And uh, it, it, it really needs to work. It needs to be a productive, healthy culture that fosters the right type of environment because uh, like the, the old adage goes, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together, right? So our team needs to be capable of a lot and the right culture makes a huge difference. 
So I may ask you even a follow-up question or two specifically about that, because you mentioned developing a culture of a experimental mindset, which like I've heard you mention before is very important, especially for those companies that are kind of pre product market fit. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of the role of a CXO in doing that? And what are some of the things that you need to do in order to foster that type of a healthy environment? Sure. So this, this is a, this, so let me take one step back because I think what we, we need to, to, to realize is that um, when we're talking about technology, whether uh, you're talking about people problems, all products are problems that need to be solved uh, or, or, or products that solve a problem in a slightly different way. There's an old saying that goes around in design, which is a man doesn't buy a drill, he buys a quarter inch hole. Um, you know, that is repeatable. And that's what all products and services do is they, 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 they meet a human need. And so where folks that may come from a business background, uh, nothing on business school, but um, they talk about the unit economics and the P&L, and those are all, those are data, um, but they are downstream trailing indicators of what people have done and why, why they either chose your product or didn't choose your product, uh, why they clicked or why they didn't click. Uh, and it has to come down to how well do you suit that need? How well do you tell the story the person wants to hear? Uh, and how well do you deliver on the promise that was told in that story? And that all starts with people. Uh, and so the one thing that you can't fake in a company, uh, and this is the big takeaway, you know, the at Amazon, we talked about missionary mercenary and I got my start literally as a missionary. I was in the Jesuit volunteers, uh, is, uh, that customer obsession. Uh, you cannot like it, and it's really about uh, self-interest rightly understood, right? I think as Adam Smith would call it, right? Which is you, you, have to, um, you have to solve the problem well and be obsessed about what you're doing for that customer because if you solve it well enough and at good enough value, they'll never stop using you. They'll never stop paying you. The, the money is a, is a trailing indicator of you solve the problem well. Um, at least in a sustainable way. You can't, you, you can't take somebody who's a complete mercenary turn and burn salesperson and turn them into someone who's customer obsessed uh, quickly. It's, it's a hard mindset shift. 100% totally picking up what you're putting down and love it. It is right the right type of an environment like there. It's amazing what those teams are capable of. So having someone championing that effort and what you refer to is right uh, being like customer obsessed almost i also like how you worded it in terms of the revenue that follows just in, essentially is proof that you're solving the right problem you're solving the right problem in the right way because if you keep doing that that will remain and likely grow mm -hmm. but the culture is such a key component to that and i think it doesn't get mentioned enough so i'm really glad that you are emphasizing that because fostering that, fostering the right type of environment and interaction amongst your team, it, it makes or breaks companies, like you've said before. Absolutely. And if you look at the most successful, uh, like legendary organizations over the course of history, and, you know, it's very broad, it started with a distinct, clear worldview and ethos about what it valued. Uh, you know, my, my father was a general in the Marines. So I got inculcated into that culture. Uh, you know, I, I love the Marine Corps. I just uh, hate running and I'm not good at subordination. So it's not, <laughs> so maybe not a good fit, but uh, I love the ethos of that, of that type of an organization. It's very mission driven. It's, it's uh, very, got a very strong worldview, but it's actually, a, I had a big military family. Uh, the, it's the most romantic of them. They understand their history. They understand their, their legacy and what they're part of. And the Amazon was a lot like that in, in many ways. People would quote things and it had its own dark humor and, and those sorts of things that you, you knew you were there for the right reasons or you knew it wasn't for you pretty quickly. Absolutely. And it makes a significant difference, right? It's a big impact. Those things can have a tremendous impact, um, obviously on your culture. So awesome. Love that. Thank you for that background. Talking about part of the conversation we wanted to have today as well, too. Um, I guess one other follow-up on that 
same kind of line of thought was you had mentioned a kind of comparing and contrasting a difference east coast versus west coast that's something we've talked about on the show before and i know you've made this round trip a few times and have experience at these significant tech companies and understand a bit of a difference there i refer to it from time to time in the work that i do but it's always super helpful to hear essentially the latest and developing trends there and those differing perspectives from someone who's you know in the middle of it right so if you could talk a little bit about those differences when it comes to running these organizations and perhaps what you might recommend east coast companies do more of or west coast companies do more of seeing as how you've seen the pros and cons of each approach perhaps as it even uh, pertains to the role that you have now i think that would be super interesting to learn more about as well yeah and you know before we get started i will say for the record that i i love both tupac and biggie so i'm not <laughs> going to uh safe you know, words and i think <laughs> I've, I've like since high school, I've moved all over the place. I've, I've lived all over the Midwest. So grew up in Washington, DC, back uh, college in Ohio, back to DC, South Dakota, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Indiana, Wisconsin, California, New Jersey, Washington, and now Pennsylvania. And that's just since high school, I moved around a little bit before that too. So, um, so I've gotten to see a lot of different slices of life, but in my tech life, um, it was really sort of from Indiana forward. Um, I've noticed that there's a there's huge regional differences in even um, different cities or different tech hubs, but um, I think the early big division was sort of Silicon Valley and the rest of the world, and then Silicon Valley and the East Coast, uh, primarily around New York and Boston, but it's sort of expanding out from there. And I think it's a lot of um, where the opportunity is. My experience um, between, say, the New York City area and um, Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley in Seattle and New York um, is really that um, on the West Coast they're less risk averse. They're they're more willing. The venture the venture money is far more willing to take a risk, and they invest in people, not necessarily business models. Uh, so Stuart Butterfield is not going to have any time. You know, it's like how many successful exits have you had? Um, who did you work for when you were at? Google, right? Or who brought you along? You know, who was your, they know, they know you. It's very, it's, uh, it's tight knit and they do look at the business idea, right? And they look at the tech, but that's how I remember back in 2009, I got approached by, uh, the founder of cheeseburger network, right? Which is like the mean, I was like, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. As I got in, you know, approached by a guy whose big claim to fame was that he got a, a million hits because he created a bacon alarm clock. That's the kind of stuff that get funded in, in, in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, Philadelphia and New York, those are far more conservative uh, markets and they, they're far more focused on even for early stage companies, the P and L and profitability and unit economics and everything else. Um, but you can kill a great idea by over pressuring, like you could make it profitable early. Um, but before you get to product market fit, it's like, did you trick your early adopters into paying something didn't fully deliver, but they're willing to put up with it, but it's never going to get mass product. What do you know about the problem you're solving? And so I think that's why you get good ideas and bad ideas look very similar. Uh, in the beginning. And that's one of the things I learned at Amazon with the, the working backwards process is that's how you beat the hell out of an idea until you figure out whether it's good or bad. Um, you know, and there's tons of iterations and, and it's very messy and um, you don't build until you absolutely must. Um, and how do you mitigate all that risk? And, but without losing focus on the customer and the problem that you're solving, it's a really, it's, it's a, it's a tough balance, but I think to a degree, that's been, at least in technology, like pure tech, cloud services and that sort of thing. That's been mastered on the West Coast far better than it has on the East Coast. But one of the things I've noticed is that when you look at, um, if you look at what companies are successful in these various tech hubs, like uh, FinTech and AdTech, those are really great in New York, right? Uh, uh, entertainment tech, really great in LA, right? Uh, cannabis tech, Denver's your place, right? Like yep. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that go into that um, that are these businesses. And I think like that's the thing that makes me really hopeful in this move to remote uh, more 
uh, is that you're going to see a lot of those innovations and in in more peanut buttering of that of that culture and those ideas and those points of view as people leave those big tech hubs because they're they're not actually that fun to live in anymore. They're they're super expensive. It's hard to raise a family. It's hard to kind of balance work and life, and that's that's happening more and more. So I think you're going to see more of that innovation and expectations for culture and the money come migrate to markets like Philadelphia and other emerging tech markets. Excellent. And a great first step there is attracting talent like yourself back to the East Coast. So welcome back to Philly, uh, first and foremost. Yeah. And well, my, my family, I, I grew up in DC, but all my family is here. Like my, my dad's side of the family is from here. My brothers all grew up on the main line. So Fair enough. Well, um, that's, I know that's a big part of it, right? So keeping track of that kind of stuff is always encouraging to see. Because I think yeah. that's going to make a big impact to it as well. Too, that and I, I haven't had a decent sure. sandwich in half a decade. So I was like, <laughs> right. I had my first cheese steak, and I was like, oh my god, what did I, what did I do? <laughs> Good to be home, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for um, sharing your experience. It's always helpful to know, and uh, especially from someone who's seen both sides of it as well. There's a whole, there's a whole topic to dive into much deeper there too, and love to have you back to talk about that among others as well. Also. Um, but the next question I have for you in terms of what we want to talk about today is I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about uh, Habitat and in particular your role moving forward as the CXO in terms of uniquely differentiating the business model from Habitat from the sea of competitors and how they previously worked. Basically what I was mentioning before where a local business is been complaining that those other options are cannibalizing their business models and almost like unapologetically which this business is really struggling with. It sounds like Habitat is uniquely differentiated in a way that is in direct opposition to the competition, but also, you know, so it seems like it's both what the customer actually wants, but also um, direct opposite of what a lot of the competitors of yours offer, which is an excellent position typically to find yourself in. So I'd love to hear more from you in terms of, is that the approach, is that by design, what type of market research goes into ultimately building a model like that? Really just talking about, um, you know, how you in a multi, you know, it's multi-dimensional, it's multivariate equation, but like you said, in, in retaining that customer obsessed mindset, making sure you're solving the right problems. How do you go about designing a model that works better than other models in a space that's crowded? Um, oh, wow. Um, that's a, that's a big question. I know that's a loaded think, question. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, obviously, like, you know, if I answered this one, then I've put us all out of business, right, on the, on the product <laughs> consulting thing. Right, right. Uh, uh, no, the, I think the, the uh, so I'm brand new in the role. I'm, I'm about a month in. Uh, I've known the Habitat guys for about six months or so. Um, and I think you have to start with not looking at what is, um, but what could be, right? I mean, that's, that's the entrepreneurial sort of vision. And I think, um, but at, how do you add rigor? So you've got all the raw materials. You've got a great idea. You've got a really strong founding team for their age. Uh, I've, I've, I've broken the curve in terms of age. I'm, I'm the oldest guy in the company by about two decades right now. Um, and so there, that, 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 that's bringing in, um, you know, a, a, maybe a certain level of experience and discipline, but I think um, all the raw materials are there and the tech is the easy part. People think of that, the tech being super hard, but, uh, you know, is it, uh, somebody said that, you know, a good engineer can take the impossible and make it merely difficult. Uh, you know, you can take, you can take, you can take, you can find engineers that want to solve hard, interesting problems. I think, the part of it is how do you make it interesting and how do you align people's um, whether it's their motivations uh, and there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation like options. And also like, I feel like I'm part of a mission um, and um, that has to like, it's mission driven organizations are the ones that, that, that maintain, that maintain their growth over the, t over time. So if you can take the culture and you can align and you can recruit for and select for and promote for and compensate for people that have that, that human centered point of view and then bring the right tool sets in to help them um, hone those ideas and without losing that vision. 
right? So there's tools that I learned at Amazon with um, the PRFAQ, the working backwards process. Um, we have a, a new tool that I'm introducing called the correction of error document, or sometimes euphemistically known as the celebration of error document, because uh, rather than pointing fingers, it is a root clause analysis tool that is collaborative. And we look at what went wrong and we get to, well, why using five whys, why did that go wrong? You know, what, why did that happen? Why did that happen? And we document it, we write it all down and we talk about what was the impact to the customer? What was the impact to our business? Um, what are we going, what a corrective action are we going to take in order to change it? And then we save it. It becomes part of uh, the record as opposed to tribal knowledge that leaves the door when the guy that it happened to leaves, right? We also don't punish honest failure. Failure is necessary for learner. We talk, we talk about lean and MVP and the whole point of an MVP is to fail. Uh, it's not to succeed. It's actually to fail in small ways so that you can win in bigger ways. Uh, and that's what's often get lost is people are too busy assigning blame and not busy enough solving the problem or what the root issue was and iterating. And I think a lot of companies, this is the thing that made Amazon different. It's, it's almost like growth mindset at scale. It doesn't allow failure. It doesn't allow social pressure, appeal pressure. You know, Bezos was famous for saying, uh, we need to be willing to be misunderstood for possibly for a long time. Um, is how do you, how do you get, you can't get to something like AWS without having a ton of failures. You can't get to something to the scale of Amazon logistics. And I was there in the early days and there were a lot of failures, like some of them like front page of newspaper failures, uh, you know, or evening lead story on the evening news failures. Right. So those are, those are things that you, um, you definitely learn from. Uh, and there were processes and mechanisms and accountability, lines of accountability, but first principles that you align on because what we do is hard and it's super ambiguous. And if you're waiting to be told what to do and you don't feel empowered to do anything, everything's going to go slower. Uh, and in a startup, that is death. So, yeah, some excellent examples and a lot to, but, a lot to unpack and think about. But I th I think like, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like the difference between Habitat and some of our competitors um, is we're looking at meal delivery or uh, restaurant delivery as our beachhead, right? It's not the first thing that we do. Uh, I can tell you, I've worked on incredibly complex stuff. Like Alexa was really hard. Some of the stuff I've done in vehicles was hard. Um, E-commerce is hard. Uh, computer vision, all that kind of stuff. It's hard. It's interesting. It's fun. Um, nothing compares to last mile logistics. 53% uh, of the entire cost of delivery goes into the last mile, which is from the delivery station to the doorstep. Uh, and most of that cost goes is what I call the uh, last 100 feet or the car door to the doorstep for the driver or the, the van door to the doorstep because Everything is an edge case. Um, you know, at Amazon, when we were uh, scaling out Amazon Flex and AMZL and all these other things for last mile, every second we could shave off of the global delivery time uh, amounted to a million dollars uh, to the bottom line at that scale. Um, and it, I mean, it was billions and billions. I mean, they spent $21 billion on logistics uh, the year I left. 11 and a half billion of that fell into the last mile scope, right? So that's, a, that's a, that's a, that gives you a, a, a sense of like, if you can optimize that and you can prove that you create a platform in the same way that AWS is a platform uh, with, with its own flywheels um, to create opportunities. Like what could you do with say meal kit deliveries or small retailers or, uh, even individuals like, you know, I don't want to get too much into some of the things that we're talking about, but like there are, there are different ways to skin that cat and they don't need to be Uber, right? Uh, I don't want to be Uber. Uh, th th and th there's, there's, I think coming challenges um, just in, in the legislative or legal landscape that are going to make it harder for Uber to be Uber. So 
you know, what do you do with all this? And I think when you look at this and, and we're, we're looking at it from the point of view of like, well, there's Amazon and, you know, obviously I'm a fan, but like there's Amazon and then there's Shopify. Shopify has aligned itself with small and medium sized businesses, small sellers. They're not taking a huge percentage of sales off the top. They're not charging you rent to store stuff in a fulfillment facility. Um, they're just sort of empowering the entrepreneur to be the entrepreneur. And I, I love that about that company. Um, Amazon has that aspect, but they, they put a little bit more of it on rails and, and they've gotten really big and it's hard to get out. And they're also selling stuff in their own marketplace, which um, I'll leave that to the justice department to go figure out. Uh, you know, so, so there's their own, there's, the, I mean, nothing's, nothing's perfect and things are subject to change. But I think if I want to be aligned with something at this phase in my life, I want to be more aligned with reconnecting Main Street to Wall Street. Uh, I think small is going to be the next big. And we need to look at ways and technologies to power that kind of success. Because I feel like that's the future of the American dream. Like, it's not dead. It's not gone. It just needs a kick in the butt. And it needs platforms to be able to do that. Awesome. That's Habitat. That's a perfect place to kind of uh, break from there. I think that's an excellent way to summarize uh, everything, all the awesome stuff we talked about here today. Thank you for being here, Trip. I um, only have two questions for you before I let you go. And the first one is, what resources, if any, would you share with our listeners where they can go lear to learn more about you or Habitat or any of the oh, sure. topics that we mentioned today? Well, you, you've probably picked up that I have no problem talking. Uh, and I also have a podcast. Uh, it's called The Brave New Workforce. We talk a lot. My, my co-host, Larry and Anna, uh, and, and we have guests on. We talk a lot about stuff. And that, that all uh, about related to culture and work and remote first and the post pandemic economy. It's, you know, a lot of what I've talked about today, it goes into that as well. Uh, and we talk about things like logistics, but remote work. And we feel that there's a silver lining and like as bad as the pandemic is and as tragic as this been, as this has been, there've been the, the, the black death in Europe, which wiped out many, many, many more people actually is, seen as a contributing factor to the Renaissance. And I think like there can be bounces coming out of this if we rethink problems. And that's what we talk about there. Um, in terms of resources, if you probably, there's a book I always recommend to folks uh, who are interested in things like product and market, product market fit. Uh, and it's called Trade Off by Kevin Maney. I think that's the author's name, um, but it's a great book. And it, it talks about how Great products and services sit on two ends of a fidelity spectrum. Uh, and when you try to split the difference and be kind of not the best, but not the worst, not the cheapest, but not the most expensive, you kind of end up with a meh product, right? Uh, and it, and it, he, he looks at that pattern and applies it. And I think that's, that's really, really informed my, my approach to product thinking. Um, and I probably have too many books on culture to, to fit all in, in one go. But um, yeah, check out the podcast. You know, uh, reach out to me over Twitter. I'm at, at Trip Odell. And it's a nice thing about having a weird first name is that uh, you get to be the only one on the internet. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Todd, for sharing those resources, Trip. We'll link to them in the notes. And the last question I had for you was, who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Oh, um, you know, if you're, if you're a small business uh, owner uh, or interested in learning how we can help accelerate, you know, your needs in the pandemic, uh, feel free to reach out, like whether it's just a quick conversation. Um, you know, we talk with a lot of businesses around how do you pivot your model or create an add-on. So my stepbrother, Tom Pazika, actually, he's fully native, but he's a Food Network guy and, and, uh, he's pivoted to this model where he's doing a, a week's worth of meals and selling that in one go. And then he's doing his own fulfillment out of that. And for a restaurant guy and a professionally changed, chain, his unit economics, like his margin is like 30% on his food, which is unheard of in the restaurant business, right? A, if you have a kitchen, if you have these resources, if you're trying to keep your staff engaged, that's not, that's an alternative, but it's also an and, it's not, it's not an either or, it's an and. So you could run your restaurant, you could do that kind of a model. Reach out to us, we can help with that. We can help with free advice. Uh, there's all sorts of things. So that's, uh, you can reach me at trip 
Odell at tryhabitat.com. Awesome. Thank you for providing trip and thank you for being here and sharing your incredible knowledge and experience with both myself and our audience. Oh, thanks, Sean. It was my pleasure. It was all mine. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Product Launch Podcast powered by Next Step. If you or anyone you know is involved in scaling a B2B SaaS business, please have them reach out to me about becoming a potential guest on our show. They can email me at sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. At this time, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of our show, Next Step Consulting. Would you like to know what the right next steps are for your B2B SaaS business? Are you trying to grow and scale, but you're stuck? We can help. To find out how Next Step can help your B2B SaaS business achieve its goals, please email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. Thanks and keep disrupting.